After posting my initial review of the Zoom H5 a couple of years back, and interacting with the hundreds of comments and questions, I've compiled a new, more complete review. In this video, I'll not only go over what this handheld recording device can do and who should buy it, but I've included new information based on commonly asked questions from you, the community. I've also included chapters in the video so you can skip around the parts that interest you the most if you want to. So presumably you've owned a Zoom H4N Pro for a while now and you're looking to upgrade. Maybe you're thinking about starting a podcast with a friend and you're trying to find out what recorder you should buy in order to get started. No matter what the case may be, in this video, we're going to answer those questions and more. By the way, if you'd like to see my other Zoom reviews as well, there's a link down below in the description. Let's start with the inputs. The Zoom H5 has two XLR slash TRS inputs and a 3.5mm stereo mini jack input. In simple terms, the XLR inputs are for larger microphones, such as the ones used in podcasts or boom mics, which are used to record dialogue and film and certain sound effects. The XY mic has a mic slash line input jack, which can be used to connect an external mic or line level device. This jack can also provide plug-in power to mics that need it. This is useful if you need to plug in a lavalier mic, for example, in order to record dialogue. If you have a smartphone lavalier microphone, chances are it has a TRRS plug, which will not work with this recorder. A TRRS to TRS cable adapter should do the trick though. If you plan on doing journalism or recording one-on-one -on -one interviews, which would only require a maximum of two external microphones, the two XLR inputs on the Zoom H5 will be sufficient. If you plan on recording a podcast though, bear in mind the two microphone limitation. If you find yourself in need of more inputs, you might want to have a look at the Zoom H6. Link to that video down below. According to Zoom, the H5 should be able to run for about 15 hours. Bear in mind that your mileage may vary as different variables, such as whether you're using phantom power or not, can affect how long the recorder can go for. There are many different variables which could potentially affect the battery life of the device, but the important thing is that the H5 can record for hours at a time and it's always worth carrying some extra batteries with you just in case. Given that the Zoom H5 takes two AA batteries, packing a few extra should be enough, depending what your plans are. I haven't tested this out on the Zoom H5, but a lot of these devices can work off of power banks. Alternatively, you can purchase the APH5 accessory pack for it. The pack contains a power adapter and cable, amongst other things, so that you can run the device off the mains. Speaking of accessories, if you do go ahead and purchase the APH5 accessory pack, you'll also get a windscreen, which is quite handy when recording outdoors, and a wired remote. The actual dimensions of the Zoom H5 are 7.77 by 2.63 by 1.66 inches, and it weighs 9.52 ounces, or 269 grams. Even though it is relatively light, it feels sturdy in the hand, and it looks rather rugged. You should always treat your equipment with care, but I personally wouldn't be too worried about roughing this recorder up a bit. The Zoom H5 is very portable, and it comes with a plastic case which is cushioned and compact. This allows you to safely carry your recorder around, whilst not impeding you if you quickly need to take it out and record. If you want a soft case for it, you can have a look at the PCH5. When it comes to its display, the H5 has a backlit LCD screen. This is great if you're recording in low light conditions. If you're mounting the recorder on a DSLR, the position of the screen could be better. As I've said in my Zoom H6 video, manufacturers should start including swivel screens with future iterations of these recorders. This would make them that much more versatile. The versatility that a device such as the Zoom H5 offers is one of the main reasons why you choose to buy it over the Zoom H4M Pro, for example. Much like the Zoom H6, the H5 has an array of capsules that it can use, which are also cross-compatible with the H6 and the H8. I've purchased all of the capsules for review purposes, so let's go through each and see what they're good for. 
the EXH6 Combo Input Capsule. This capsule allows you to connect two external microphones, instruments, mixers or portable music players to the Zoom H5. Note that this capsule unfortunately cannot provide phantom power to the two inputs, somewhat limiting your options of microphones. The MSH6 Capsule The MS in the name stands for Mid-Side Recording, which is a technique that allows you to adjust the width of the stereo image after the recording has already taken place. This is useful, as it gives you a lot more flexibility in post-production. The XYH6 Capsule this capsule comes by default with the Zoom H6 and adds two matched, high-quality, unidirectional microphones to your device. The capsule is more sensitive to sound coming from in front of it than from the sides or behind it. It is mostly used to record natural ambiences, live performances, instruments and some sound effects. The XYH5 Shock Mount Capsule This one comes by default with the Zoom H5. It is similar to the XYH6 capsule that we looked at earlier, but it has built-in shock mounts. The purpose of the shock mount is to minimize vibrations affecting the recording, either from handling the recorder or from the surface the recorder is placed on. The SSH6 Mid-Side Stereo Shotgun Microphone Capsule This includes a super-directional microphone, which picks up sound in the center, as well as a bi-directional side mic for picking up sounds from the left and the right. The advantage of this microphone would be that you can record dialogue with the directional mic and then mix in as much or as little of the environment as you'd like, which was captured with the bi-directional side mic. This can be done both in post-production and directly in the Zoom recorder. SGH6 Shotgun Microphone Capsule Highly directional it allows you to record focused sound without having to carry a separate microphone and grip with the recorder. Whilst these can be better, they can also be way more expensive and burdensome to carry. This is a winning combo if you prefer to have a compact setup like I do. Because of its directionality, it mostly picks up sounds from in front of it whilst largely ignoring anything coming from the side or the back. By the way, the narration for this video was recorded with the Zoom H6 and this capsule. I use a Manfrotto desk stand in conjunction with them and the microphone itself is aimed at my mouth from the side. The reason is because I like to have the mic quite close to me and having it on the side prevents plosives. As a quick side note, one of the benefits of these capsules is that if one stops working, you don't have to bend the whole unit. Instead, you can just buy a new capsule and keep using the recording device. Additionally, Zoom provides you with these plastic tabs which protect the connection points from dust. As fantastic as they are, I wish there was some built-in slot in the device where I can keep them when using a capsule. As things stand, I've been known to lose the plastic tabs. As I've mentioned before, I'm currently recording my voiceovers with the Zoom H6 and the SGH6. I switched to this from my older setup which involved a Shure SM7B, a cloud lifter and a Zoom H8. The reason is because it's far more portable whilst delivering similar quality. The reason why I chose the SGH6 over just using the default XY capsule that came with the Zoom H6 is because the SGH6 is a lot more directional. As a digital nomad, I travel around and I can't always know what the acoustics of a place will be when I'm booking it. As a result, I use a highly directional microphone, which will mostly just focus on my voice and it will ignore the sound reflections coming from the side and other unwanted noise coming from the back. You can use the XY capsule that comes with the device, but you'll be capturing a lot more of the room instead of a more isolated sound. This can be a good or a bad thing, depending on the situation. Next up, I wanted to cover one of the more useful features of this device and at the same time discuss its unfortunate limitations. The Zoom H5 has a feature called minus 12 dB backup. What it does is when recording, it creates a backup of your recording, which is minus 12 dB quieter. The reason for this is that if you get too loud when recording and you get distortion, you can go into the minus 12 dB safety track and replace a distorted clip with the quieter, undistorted version. This sounds fantastic in theory, but there is an issue. When I first heard about this, my assumption was that this feature could be applied to all four inputs, or at the very least, the two built-in ones. 
As it turns out, this only applies to the left and the right channels. So for instance, on recordings that you capture with the XY capsule. As a result, you can't do this for a microphone or instrument plugged into any of the four XLR slash TRS inputs. The strange thing about this is that I've seen quite a few conflicting opinions online. Some people say that they've managed to get backups of XLR microphones, whilst others say that they can't. My assumption is that the ones that did get them used the EXH6 combo input capsule to plug in the XLRs. That might actually work, but that's a use case that applies to very few people. This does not affect someone like me, who uses the Zoom H6 in conjunction with the SGH6 shotgun microphone capsule, but it would impact someone recording a podcast, for example. I assume this feature is incomplete due to a limitation in processing power. If you know a workaround for this, make sure to leave it down below in the comments. Now that we've covered safety tracks, I actually want to talk about setting healthy levels and how to avoid needing a backup track in the first place. Here is the simplest way I can describe setting levels. Peak as high as you can without actually clipping. In practical terms, set your levels so that you don't really peak above minus 6 dB. Try to keep the average around minus 12 dB with softer sounds hitting around minus 20 dB. You'll find a lot of debate online as to how you should set your levels, but use the numbers I've given you and play around with your device until you get results that you like. When in doubt, it's always better to set them too low than too high. If it's too high, your recording will be distorted, which will make it unusable. If it's too low, you'll get hiss in your recording, but that's preferable to the alternative. Let's talk about sample rates, bit depth, and file types. I'm not only going to run you through which sample rates, bit depths, and file types are supported by the Zoom H5, but I'm also going to tell you which you should use. First off, you can pick between 16 and 24 bit. Not going to go too deep into this one, just go ahead and stick with 24-bit. In terms of file type, always use WAV files. This will produce a file that is rich in audio information, which is preferable to an MP3. An MP3 intentionally excludes some data, which will somewhat degrade the quality of your audio in the interest of a smaller file size. The only instance you'd want to use the MP3 format is if you strictly use your Zoom H5 as a dictaphone. If that's your use case, then go ahead, but most people looking for dictaphones will usually opt for a smaller and cheaper device. When it comes to the sample rate, you have a few options. I'm not going to go into the science of it, but you can think of sample rate kind of like frames per second in video. If you're just filming someone talking, no need to go beyond 30 frames per second. If you want to be able to slow the footage down though and not get weird artifacts when doing so, you shoot at 60 FPS or above. Your choice of sample rate and audio follows a similar logic. Here are the sample rates you'll have access to and what they're usually used for. 44.1 kHz. But this is typically used for recording music. There is of course nothing stopping you from recording your music at 48kHz or 96kHz, but unless you plan on doing some crazy audio manipulation, 44.1kHz would be just fine. 48kHz This is typically used for audio which will play alongside picture, like dialogue or a voiceover track for a video. It's a sample rate often considered more pro compared to 44.1 kHz, which is seen as something aimed more at consumers. 96 kHz. Use this if you're going to record ambiences or sound effects which will be used for sound design purposes. There is nothing stopping you from using any sample rate, by the way, but when it comes to specific use cases, some sample rates are more indicated than others. The H5 can also be used as an audio interface with your DAW of choice. All you have to do is go into menu, select USB, and then audio interface. The device then gives you the option of either going via the route of stereo mix or multi-track. Once you've done that, you'll have to select either PC Mac bus powered or PC Mac battery. If your computer can't supply enough power to the device when using phantom power, select PC Mac battery. This will use some of the battery in the H5 in order to provide phantom power. 
In regards to noise, the Zoom H5 has the same preamps as the Zoom H4M Pro and the Zoom H6. No major differences between the two when it comes to audio quality. When it comes to the preamps, neither of them are as good as the Sony PCMD100, but more on that later. If your aim is to record super quiet ambiences, the Zoom H5 would not be my first choice. In fact, none of the Zoom handheld recorders would. Instead, I'd go for the Sony PCMD100. Even though it can record quiet ambiences with minimal hiss, you do not have XLR inputs. Now, you can connect microphones to it via the stereo mini jack input, and you can even jerry rig it to connect XLRs, but at that point, why not invest in a device that has dedicated XLR inputs? Given the price of the Sony PCMD100, which has historically been far higher than that of the Zoom H5, if you really need to connect XLR mics to it, I look for entirely other options. P.S. A great potential use for the Sony PCMD100 would be when recording ASMR due to its low noise floor. If you'd like to hear what the PCMD100 sounds like when recording quiet ambiences, here is a sample from one of my sound libraries. The Zoom H5 does not have built-in guitar effects, like the H4M Pro or the Zoom H8, but it does have a built-in tuner. This is not something that I've ever used, as I prefer to record my electric guitar tracks clean and then add effects later, but this is something that a lot of guitar players might be interested in. In terms of affordability, whilst the prices may vary depending on where you are, the Zoom H5 remains a relatively affordable, portable recording device. I found the design and menus to be intuitive and easy to use on the Zoom H5. Swapping capsules is also painless and quick to do. When under time constraints, this is a massive plus. There's nothing worse than missing a great recording because you couldn't figure out the menus or because navigating them was a pain. Whilst the Zoom H5 does not offer any built-in storage, it can record directly to SD and SDHC cards up to 32GB in size. Even if you're recording at 96kHz, that's a lot of space for your recordings. If you're recording a stereo track at 24bit by 48kHz, 32GB would in theory allow you to record about 2000 minutes or 33 hours. If you need to record outdoors, which might be the case if you're a journalist, sound effects recordist, field recordist, sound designer, if you're recording a live band or more, the foam windshield that comes with the recorder will prove itself to be rather unhelpful. It's okay when recording indoors, but any real gust of wind will make your recording unusable. Luckily, Rycote sells a free-in-one solution for the Zoom H5. A grip by which you can hold the recorder, a shock mount, which basically eliminates handling noise, and a good quality windshield, which will protect the microphone from wind, although very strong winds might still affect the microphone. A known issue with the Zoom H5 that some people have reported is that after a while, the rubber casing becomes sticky. With that in mind, I have been able to find videos online showing you how to deal with this problem. The reason why I'm not pointing you to any of them specifically is that I don't know if they work, as I've never had this issue with my Zoom H5. Luckily, the rubber casing becoming sticky does not seem to be a widespread problem. The Zoom H5 has a metal bar across it, which makes it difficult, if not impossible, to accidentally change the input levels. I like this, as there is a physical barrier preventing me from accidentally changing the settings, which could happen on other recorders. If you know you're likely to accidentally hit or run your hand over the recorder and thus change the levels, this might be something to take into consideration. Whilst Zoom handheld recorder preamps tend to not be seen in a positive light online, its noise levels are more than suitable for most people. For instance, if you want to record something really quiet, like a very light rain in a quiet forest or ASMR, you'll get noticeable hiss in your recordings. This is due to the preamps, and all recording devices have some measure of hiss. I've mentioned the Sony PCMD100 earlier, which is more suitable for this use. 
But if you want to record louder things, such as musical instruments, live concerts, dialogue, narration, a podcast, and louder sound effects, the Zoom H5 will do just fine. As I've mentioned before, the narration for this video was recorded on a Zoom H6, which has the same preamps. So, should you buy it? The Zoom H5 is modular, rugged, and versatile, with great sound quality and dual XLR slash DRS inputs. If that's all you need, the Zoom H5 would be a great investment. That being said, if you think you might one day need to plug in a few extra microphones, it's worth spending a little bit of extra money in getting the Zoom H6. If you'd like to see a comparison between the Zoom H5 and the other Zoom handheld recorders, you can find the link down below. Do you have any questions? Feel free to leave a comment down below and I'll do my best to get back to you. If you'd like to purchase any of the items I've mentioned in this video or see how much they cost in your country, I have a link down below where you can view them. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to leave a like, subscribe and hit that bell, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.